I'm gonna offer you a proposition. We're gonna roll these dice. You get to pick one, I get to pick one. When yours beats mine, I give you a dollar. If mine happens to beat yours, you give me a dollar. Now, normally that would not be a very interesting game because half the time you'd get a dollar, half the time I'd get a dollar, and that's that, that'd be the game. But in this case, these are special dice. Now, that might make you worry a little bit, so I want everything to be above board. I'm gonna let you choose which die you want, and I'm gonna show you how they work, for example, I can tell you the one on the left, which I'm going to call die A, beats the one in the middle, which I'm going to call die B, about 58% of the time. In fact, for that matter, die B beats die C, that's the one on the right, also about 58% of the time. And I'm going to let you pick which of these three dice you want to roll, and then, you know, I'll pick another one. Now, a clever person like yourself, of course, you can see A beats B, B beats C. The best move is to pick A, right? Well, if you pick A, I'm actually going to go ahead and pick C, and I'm going to end up beating you about 69% of the time. What? How is this possible? This is a case of what are called intransitive dice. Just because A beats B most of the time and B beats C most of the time, that doesn't necessarily mean that C beats A most of the time. In fact, in this case, you can see C beats A by even more than either A beat B or B beat C. Now, you can obviously tell these can't be fair dice, but they're not unfair in the way that dice sometimes are. They're not weighted dice. What we mean when we talk about weighted dice is literally that. With a physical object, one portion of the die is weighted more than another, so that typically higher numbers would come up. In this case, the die would look like a standard six-sided die. It would have six faces, each of which has the numbers one through six. One, two, three, four, five, six, just like this die here. One way you'd be able to tell such a weighted die is if you took a look at the different rolls it got over time, if you average those all together, you would end up with what we call an expected value for the die. What it should be is simply the sum one plus two plus three plus four plus five plus six divided by six. That is, there are six possible outcomes, and on a standard six-sided die, one that's not been messed with, each outcome is equally likely. If we add all this together, we get 21 over six, which is the same thing as 3.5, which makes sense because essentially what that's telling us is half the time we're gonna get a value less than three, that is a one, two, or three, and half the time we're gonna get a value above three, a four, a five, or a six. A weighted die is gonna deviate from this. As we roll it over and over again, we're gonna notice that the expected value does not average out to three and a half. Instead, it averages out to, again, something different, but likely something higher. That's that's not what's going on with our intransitive dice over here. If you took a look at the actual rolls and you averaged them all together, you would find that each individual die does have an expected value of 3.5. These are not weighted dice. But obviously that doesn't mean that they are standard dice. These are funny dice. In fact, I'll go ahead and show them to you right now. One of them has five faces that are a three and one face that's a six. One of them has three faces that are twos and three faces that are fives and one of them has one face that's a one and five faces that are fours. Now again, if you take any one of those particular arrangements, say we take die A's arrangement of five threes and a six, and you add all of that together, five threes makes 15 plus six makes 21, and you can see you end up with the proper expected value for that die. In fact, the same thing is true for die B and die C. All three of these dice have the correct expected value. So obviously they're not weighted, but still something is going on here. We need another tool from probability. We need what's called a sample space. A sample space is most basically just a list of all possible outcomes. And in the case of two standard six-sided die, it's relatively easy to show our actual sample space. We can list out the 36 possibilities that there are for any given standard role. When we look at those possibilities, we can also check on who's winning in any given case. As I look at the sample space, I can see, okay, first of all, out of these 36 possible outcomes, there are six outcomes, you can see those in gray right now, where actually the two dice tied. When we were rolling our special intransitive dice, there were never any ties. So even on top of everything else that's going on, that's weird. Of the 30 remaining outcomes, half the time, that is 15 of the outcomes, die A is going to win, and then the other half of the time, the other 15 outcomes, die B is going to win. You can see that here in blue. Now, that's what's going on with our standard six-sided dice, but we're going to see something quite a bit different with these intransitive dice. For example, here I have the sample space for die A 
versus die B. Again, die A has a three coming up for five of the six faces and then a six for the sixth face, and die B is split evenly between twos and fives. When we pull up which die is winning now, we can see first of all, there are no more ties at all. Ties are not possible with these particular faces. And instead of the outcomes being split evenly, we can see that die A is going to win a little bit more often. Specifically, it wins 21 out of the 36 times, which is about that 58%, and then die B wins the other 42-ish percent of the time. We can do the same thing for die B versus die C and die C versus die A, but at some point it gets a little annoying to do these sample spaces over and over again, and so it would be nice to have some other tools that we could use to tackle probability. And that's why I'm so happy to have Brilliant.org sponsoring today video. Brilliant has built an amazing platform for helping people develop the additional tools you'd need to really master things like probability and counting. Brilliant helps you learn probability, statistics, and science interactively, though that really only scratches the surface of what you can accomplish on their platform. Brilliant has thousands of lessons available, not only in things like probability, counting, statistics, but also AI, data science, and they're adding more lessons every month. With probability in particular, I love what Brilliant has to offer because probability is not typically a standard part of your math curriculum. It's something that just kind of gets thrown in at the end of a bunch of other classes. So if you're looking for that additional challenge, whether you're a student learning it for the first time or a lifelong learner like me, I'm clicking around here on one of Brilliant.org's probability classes, it is a fantastic tool to help you learn that material. To try everything Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days, check out brilliant.org slash polymathematic. Or click on the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Whether you are that student going through it for the first time or, like me, just trying to expand your abilities, I think Brilliant's platform can really help and I hope you'll take advantage. Thank you again to Brilliant.org for sponsoring today's video. The tool we're going to use to calculate these probabilities, rather than just literally listing out every possible outcome, is essentially an area model. Basically, we want to divide this up into the possible outcomes for each die. And again, for these non-standard dice, those outcomes are much more limited. For die A, it could come up either a 3 or a 6, the 3 happened 5 times, and the 6 happened just once. For die B, it could come up a 2 or a 5, and again, each one of those happened half the time. Instead of listing out all the possible outcomes, Outcomes, we're actually just going to multiply the different probabilities to see overall what the probability is of any particular outcome. For example, the probability that die A comes up 3 while die B comes up 2, we can actually calculate by just multiplying the 5 out of 6 faces that are a 3 for die A by the 3 out of 6 faces that are a 2 for die B. And that gives us 15 out of 36 possible outcomes where A is a 3 and B is a 2. And that works out to roughly 42% of the time. Similarly, 5 out of 6 times 3 out of 6, there should be another 15 out of 36 outcomes, or another 42%, where A is a 3 and B is a 5. We can go on to figure out there are going to be 3 out of 36 outcomes, or just about 8 and a third percent, but we'll just call it 8%, and another 3 out of 36 outcomes where A is a 6, but die B is a 5. To figure out the chances overall that A is going to win, we just have to add together the different boxes where A's role is greater than B's role. And we can see in this case that happens in three out of the four boxes. But those boxes aren't equally likely, so we wouldn't call that 75% or anything. We would just literally add together 42, 8, and 8, and that would give us our roughly 58% of the time that die A is coming out ahead of die B. We can do the same thing to figure out what's going on with B versus C. Again, C has a 1 out of 6 chance of coming up a 1, and B has that same 3 out of 6 chance of coming up a 2, and so we could say overall there's a 3 out of 36, or again, roughly 8% chance that die C comes up 1 while die B comes up 2. There is also a 3 out of 36, or 8% chance that die C is a 1 while die B is a 5, and then there is a 15 out of 36 chance and another 15 out of 36 chance for these other two possible outcomes. So again, that's gonna be 42% and 42% which you can see gives us that same 58% when we add it all together where B is winning. When B has a 2 and C has a 1, it wins. When B has a 5 versus C's 1, it wins. When B has a 5 versus C's 4, it wins. The only time it's not winning is when C has a 4 and B has a 2. 
Finally, when we look at the results for die C and die A, we can see it lines up with the results from our simulation earlier. In one sense, die C is losing most of the possible outcomes. Die A is going to be ahead when it's a 3 and C is a 1, when it's a 6 and C is a 1, and even when it's a 6 and C is a 4. But because of the specific probabilities, it's far more likely that C is a 4 and A is a 3. In fact, that's what happens about 69% of the time. That's what's explaining why C mostly beats A, and in fact, why C beats A by even larger margins than A beats B or B beats C. So this tool, this essentially area model for probability, does help us understand the 1v1 interactions, A versus B, B versus C, and C versus A. It doesn't necessarily help us understand the interactions between all three. Like, when A is beating B 58% of the time, how is it possible that C then comes back and beats A 69% of the time while also losing to B 58% of the time. Now you could think of like a probability cube, if I could do this in three dimensions, or maybe if my animation skills were better, I could show you the eight different possible sets of roles and how they work, but I'm just gonna have to do it two dimensionally instead. We're gonna consider two separate area models once again, but this time we're gonna throw in a third probability. We're gonna look at A versus B, assuming C is a one, and A versus B, assuming C is a four. That is, we're essentially gonna be multiplying three different probabilities. This cell here, for example, we are assuming A comes up three, B comes up two, while at the same time C is coming up one. The likelihood of that will just be the product of these three different probabilities. So we can multiply out one sixth, three sixths, and five sixths, and figure out that that happens in 15 out of 216 cases, or what turns out to be a little under 7%. Similarly, to figure out the probability that A comes up three, B comes up five, while at the same time C comes up one, we would multiply five out of six, times three out of six, times one out of six, you'll notice it's actually the same calculation, and we would get another 15 out of 216 possible outcomes. On the other hand, something like the chances that A comes up a three and B comes up a two, which we did just consider a moment ago, but this time presuming that C comes up four is far more likely because C comes up four five out of six times rather than coming up a one, just one out of six times. So now as we multiply these probabilities, five over six times three over six times five over six, we actually end up with 75 out of 216 possible outcomes. That is a little bit less than 35%. Once we complete these two different tables, I then wanna think about what is the actual outcome here? Which die is winning in these different boxes? For example, when A is a three, B is a two, and C is a one, basically I'm gonna rank them right now. A is beating B, and B is also beating C. And I'm just gonna do that for every single one of these cells, when A is a three, B is a five, and C is a one. A is still coming out ahead of C, but this time B is beating both of them. Finally, once I've written out these outcomes for each of the different cells, I wanna to start to categorize the outcomes together. For example, I wanna look at all the different outcomes where A beats B beats C in that particular order. Again, in some sense, that is the outcome that happens the most often. There are the most ways to reach that outcome, but you can see the probability in each case is very, very low, and so it doesn't end up being a particularly common outcome overall. As we do this for all eight cells, we end up with five possibilities. Again, the one that we just looked at, A beating B beating C, but then it's also possible that A beats C, but C beats B. It's also possible B beats A, which beats C. C beats A, which beats B. And then of course that B beats C, which beats A. You'll notice there's one possible arrangement of A, B, and C that never shows up. We never end up with the outcome C beating B beating A. Just based on how the numbers worked out here, if C is beating B, C has to be getting a four, which means B has to be getting a two, and A has no role that's less than a two. And so we do have a sixth possible arrangement that just occurs 0% of the time. Summarizing this in a table finally answers our question, what on earth is going on that A can beat B most of the time, B can beat C most of the time, and yet C also beats A, not just most of the time, but even 
more than either A or B were winning. Consider the scenarios where B is beating C. That's three of the possible arrangements. First of all, if we add these up, we end up with the 58% of the time that B is beating C. But within that 58%, most of the time that B is beating C, C is also beating A. That is, looking only at those outcomes, there are 126 possibilities and 75 of them have C beating A. That works out to roughly 60% of the time. When the opposite is happening, when C is beating B, there are only two ways that it ever shows up in our table, and now we can see it's even more more stark, 75 compared to 15. That is roughly 83% of the time that C is beating B, it's also beating A. When you put this all together, you end up with this weird scenario of intransitive outcomes. Yes, A can beat B at the same time that B is beating C, and yet lose to C most of the time. When I look at it like this, it almost gives me like a Simpsons paradox vibe. I'm not quite sure that you can categorize this as one of Simpsons paradoxes. I'd have to investigate further. Maybe you can comment down below and let me know if it gives you that same vibe. Here's an additional challenge you can comment with. So I've given you one possible example of three intransitive dice. First of all, can you come up with a different possible example? And second of all, could you come up with an example for four intransitive dice? Nice. Typically, you want to keep the expected values the same for this to work, but you know, experiment, see what you come up with, and let me know. If you want to check out the simulation I used, I will put the link to that simulation in the description. I'll also go ahead and link the dice nets and the other stuff so that you can mess with those if you'd like to. Again, thank you to Brilliant.org for sponsoring today's video. If you're interested in probability or learning more about counting outcomes and things like that, I think you would really enjoy their platform, and I hope you'll check them out. Brilliant.org slash poly mathematic and again the first 200 people to sign up for an annual premium subscription will get 20% off that's all i've got for you today i will see y'all next time